September 6, 1976, Central Japan, over the Sea of Japan. At dawn, a radar contact appeared on Japanese air defense scopes moving faster and higher than anything routinely seen. Within minutes, controllers confirmed what Cold War intelligence officers had feared for years. A Soviet MiG-25 Foxbat had defected, landing intact at Hakodate Airport. For the first time, the West was about to see the aircraft that had forced an entire generation of American aerospace planning into motion. For more than a decade before that morning, the MiG-25 had haunted Western intelligence assessments. Flying at altitudes above 80,000 feet and speeds exceeding Mach 2.8 in short bursts, it had been designed with a single mission in mind, outrun, outclimb, and survive. When it first appeared publicly over Soviet airspace in the mid-1960s, its performance envelope suggested an aircraft beyond anything the United States could field. Early estimates assumed it was light, maneuverable, and powered by engines far more advanced than anything in service. Those assumptions drove fear, urgency, and funding in Washington. The Foxbat's perceived role was clear. It was meant to intercept American strategic bombers at extreme altitude, attacking targets like the B-70 and later the B-1 before they could approach Soviet airspace. Speed and altitude were its weapons. Maneuverability was not. Soviet doctrine assumed engagements would be brief, controlled by ground radar, and decided by long-range missiles launched from above the enemy. Against such a threat, existing American fighters were inadequate. The F-4 Phantom lacked the climb performance. The F-106 Delta Dart was too limited in range and flexibility. The balance of air power, at least on paper, appeared to be shifting. This was the environment in which the United States launched the FX program, the direct ancestor of the F-15 Eagle. Unlike previous fighters optimized for a single mission, the new aircraft would be built around one uncompromising idea, absolute air superiority across the full altitude spectrum. It would have to climb fast, see first, shoot first, and still retain control where thin air robbed other aircraft of lift and authority. Every design choice, from its massive wing area to its twin-engine layout, was shaped by the shadow of the MiG-25. Ironically, when engineers finally examined the defected Foxbat in Japan, many myths collapsed. But by then, the Eagle was already flying. And the confrontation that followed would prove that raw speed alone was no longer enough to dominate the skies. When Western engineers dismantled the Miji-25 after its arrival in Japan, the aircraft revealed a philosophy very different from what American planners had feared. The Foxbat was not a delicate, titanium air superiority fighter. It was a blunt, purpose-built interceptor. Nearly two-thirds of its structure was stainless steel, chosen not for elegance but for its ability to tolerate heat at sustained high speed. Its engines were powerful but short-lived, optimized for brief sprints rather than prolonged combat. The radar was formidable for its time, yet it relied heavily on ground control to function as intended. At altitude and speed, the Miji-25 was dangerous. Outside that narrow envelope, it was vulnerable. The F-15, developed under the pressure of those earlier miscalculations, embodied a fundamentally different approach. Instead of trading everything for speed, it combined power with control. Twin Pratt and Whitney F-100 engines gave it a thrust-to-weight ratio greater than one in many configurations, allowing it to climb vertically and accelerate even in thin air. Its large wing area was not an accident of design but a deliberate solution to high-altitude handling, preserving lift where other fighters became sluggish and unstable. Equally important was what the Eagle could see. The APG-63 radar introduced a step change in air combat. With true look-down, shoot-down capability and track-while scan functionality, the F-15 could detect and engage targets at altitude without relying on ground controllers. Information flowed directly to the pilot, reducing reaction time and eliminating the rigid command chains that shaped Soviet interception doctrine. At high altitude, where decisions had to be made in seconds that autonomy mattered, in exercises and later real-world encounters, this difference became decisive. While the Miji-25 could reach extreme altitude first, it often arrived there with limited options. Turning performance was restricted, energy bled rapidly in maneuver, and missile engagement windows were narrow. The F-15, by contrast, could meet it higher than expected, accelerate to comparable speeds, 
and still retain the ability to maneuver, reposition, and re-engage. Altitude ceased to be a sanctuary. By the late 1970s, this reality was filtering back through intelligence channels to Soviet pilots. The Foxbat was still fast. It was still high-flying. But it was no longer unchallenged. The assumption that speed and ceiling alone guaranteed dominance was eroding, replaced by a more uncomfortable truth. Air combat was becoming a contest of systems, not single performance numbers. And in that contest, the Eagle had been designed from the beginning to prevail. That shift in thinking did not happen overnight. For years, Soviet training and doctrine had been built around the idea that interception would be centrally controlled and technologically compartmentalized. Ground-based radars detected intruders, controllers assigned vectors, and pilots executed narrowly defined tasks at prescribed altitudes and speeds. In that framework, the MiGi-25 made sense. It was a missile truck optimized to arrive fast, launch from above, and disengage. What it was never intended to do was fight another fighter that could match its climb while outclassing it in awareness and flexibility. The F-15 exploited that mismatch relentlessly. At altitude, where thin air reduced control margins and engine responsiveness, the Eagle's design paid dividends. Its variable geometry inlets maintained airflow to the engines at high Mach numbers, while its flight control authority remained predictable even above 60,000 feet. Pilots were trained to think in terms of energy management rather than fixed interception profiles. Speed, altitude, and position were traded dynamically, not preserved at all costs. Missile employment further widened the gap. The combination of the APG-63 radar with the AIM-7 Sparrow allowed the F-15 to engage at long range with a higher probability of kill, especially when paired with autonomous targeting rather than ground queuing. Soviet missiles of the era were effective within their intended parameters, but they depended heavily on stable tracking solutions and predictable target behavior. Against an aircraft that could change altitude, heading, and speed while maintaining radar lock, those assumptions broke down. By the early 1980s, intelligence assessments began to acknowledge an uncomfortable reality for Moscow. Even when the MiG-25 reached its theoretical performance limits, it could be met, tracked, and threatened. The Eagle did not need to chase it into the extreme upper atmosphere to win the engagement. It only needed to deny the Foxbat its advantages and force it into a regime where its limitations became unavoidable. This realization echoed across Soviet aviation planning. New designs emphasized improved maneuverability, better onboard sensors, and reduced dependence on ground control. The era of the pure speed interceptor was ending. What replaced it was a recognition that dominance at altitude was no longer about who could climb highest or fly fastest, but about who could integrate propulsion, aerodynamics, sensors, and pilot decision-making into a single, coherent system. And the F-15 had demonstrated that lesson with unsettling clarity. The contrast became clearest when pilots began to encounter each other indirectly through exercises, intelligence reporting, and radar tapes rather than dogfights. Soviet air defense units tracking Western aircraft at altitude were surprised to see F-15s holding speed and climb profiles once thought exclusive to the Foxbat. The Eagle was not simply reaching those altitudes. It was operating there with margin. It could loiter, maneuver, and remain tactically flexible instead of executing a single high-speed pass. That endurance at altitude fundamentally altered the geometry of interception. For MiG-25 pilots, this was deeply unsettling. The Foxbat's cockpit workload was already heavy, with limited visibility, analog systems, and reliance on instructions from the ground. At extreme altitude, any deviation from the planned profile came at a cost in fuel and energy. Meanwhile, F-15 crews were increasingly trained to exploit uncertainty. By varying climb rates, offsetting laterally, and controlling radar exposure, they forced defenders to react rather than dictate the engagement. Control of time became as important as control of space. Western exercises reinforced these lessons. Simulated high-altitude engagements repeatedly showed that the F-15 could force the Foxbat into defensive decisions without ever needing a close-range fight. Even when the MiG-25 achieved its maximum climb, it often arrived with little situational awareness beyond what ground controllers could provide. If those links were degraded, delayed, or disrupted, the interceptor was effectively blind. The Eagle, operating with its own sensors and tactical freedom, retained initiative.
this imbalance reflected broader trends in Cold War air power. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, the United States and its allies were investing heavily in decentralized command, resilient communications, and pilot autonomy. Air combat was no longer treated as a scripted sequence but as a fluid, adaptive contest. The MiG-25 represented the culmination of an older idea, one rooted in certainty, predictability, and centralized control. As these realities became clear, the Foxbat's aura began to fade. It remained fast. It remained high-flying. But its dominance existed only within a shrinking window. Outside that window, the F-15's balance of speed, altitude performance, sensor capability, and pilot-driven tactics proved overwhelming. What had once looked like a technological terror now appeared narrowly specialized. While the Eagle emerged as a platform built for the future of air combat rather than the assumptions of the past, that reassessment carried long-term consequences far beyond the MiG-25 itself. Soviet planners now understood that altitude and speed, once considered decisive shields, could be neutralized by a fighter designed around total situational dominance. The F-15 was not faster on paper in sustained flight, nor did it claim the absolute ceiling figures associated with the Foxbat. What it demonstrated instead was that those extremes mattered less when an aircraft could arrive early, stay longer, and control the engagement environment. This realization influenced how both sides viewed future air combat. The Eagle showed that high-altitude performance was no longer an isolated metric. It was inseparable from radar processing, missile guidance, electronic resilience, and pilot training. A fighter operating near the edge of the atmosphere had to remain combat effective, not merely present. The MiG-25 could reach remarkable heights, but once there, its narrow margins left little room for adaptation. The F-15, by contrast, treated altitude as just another domain in which it could fight on its own terms. By the mid-1980s, the symbolic balance had shifted. Western pilots regarded the Foxbat with respect, but no longer with apprehension. Intelligence briefings emphasized its limitations as much as its strengths. Soviet pilots, meanwhile, trained with the understanding that speed alone would not guarantee safety against modern Western fighters. This acknowledgement fed directly into the development of more balanced designs, such as the MiG-29 and Su-27, which attempted to blend performance with maneuverability and improved sensors. The broader implication was unmistakable. The F-15's success at altitude confirmed that air superiority had entered a new era. Information, integration, and flexibility now outweighed singular performance records. Fighters would no longer win by excelling at one extreme, but by dominating across many conditions simultaneously. The Eagle's dominance over the Foxbat was not the result of a single breakthrough, but of a coherent philosophy that treated technology, doctrine, and pilot decision-making as inseparable elements of power. That lesson endures. Even decades later, the story of the MiG-25 and the F-15 remains a case study in how assumptions can shape design, and how better understanding can overturn them. When the Eagle met the Foxbat at altitude, it did more than match speed. It exposed the limits of an older way of thinking about air combat, and in doing so, quietly rewrote the rules of the Cold War sky. By the time the Cold War entered its final decade, the encounter between the MiG-25 and the F-15 had settled into its proper historical perspective. The Foxbat had never been the unbeatable superfighter many in the West once feared, nor was the Eagle merely a reaction born of panic. Together, they represented two fundamentally different answers to the same strategic problem. How to control the highest reaches of the atmosphere in an age of nuclear bombers and global surveillance. For Soviet pilots, the shock was not humiliation but revelation. The realization that an American fighter could meet them at altitude, hold comparable speed, and still retain tactical freedom forced a reckoning with long-standing assumptions. Air combat was no longer defined by who reached the engagement zone first, but by who could shape what happened next. In that environment, centralized control, rigid profiles, and narrow mission design became liabilities rather than strengths. For the United States, the F-15 validated a philosophy that would define air power for decades. This dominance was not accidental. It was the product of lessons drawn from Vietnam, intelligence failures surrounding the MiG-25, and a deliberate decision to prioritize awareness, energy control, and pilot autonomy.
Altitude became a place to fight, not merely a number to claim. Speed became a tool, not a shield. The legacy of this matchup extends far beyond the two aircraft involved. Modern fighters, regardless of nation, reflect the same conclusions reached in the thin air above 60,000 feet. That air superiority depends on integration rather than extremes, on systems rather than singular performance claims. Sensors, data fusion, electronic resilience, and training now define dominance just as much as thrust and ceiling ever did. In hindsight, the Cold War never needed a dramatic duel between the Foxbat and the Eagle to prove the point. The outcome was decided long before in design bureaus, doctrine manuals, and training syllabi. But when intelligence officers and pilots finally understood that the F-15 could match the MiG-25 at altitude and still dictate the fight, the balance of confidence shifted decisively. That quiet shift, more than any single engagement, explains why the Eagle went on to build one of the most lopsided combat records in aviation history, and why the Foxbat remains remembered not as a failure, but as a catalyst that reshaped how air superiority itself was understood. If you found this breakdown valuable, consider liking the video, subscribing for more in-depth Cold War aviation history, and sharing it with others interested in how technology and doctrine quietly shaped the skies.